Good evening, and welcome to another Brown Girls in the Rain book club, where today we discuss Sharon Bala's The Boat People. So if you don't already know, I'm Anika, and that that is Sharanjo. I'm Sharanja. Yes, and we are your hosts for the evening. So Sharanja, tell us the book's synopsis. All right, so The Boat People is about, it's a dramatized, uh, it's a fictionalized version of the real life story of the MB, MB Sunsea incident that happened in 2010. So what the MB Sunsea, it was a boat, it was a large cargo boat that landed off the coast of Victoria Island in BC. And this boat was carrying around 492 passengers from Sri Lanka. All of them were town refugees who were seeking who were seeking a asylum in Canada at the time. And in 2010, this would have been one or two years after the end of the civil war. So the, of the civil war in Sri Lanka. So it would have been just two years after the end of that war that these people got on the boat and tried to get a asylum status in in Canada. So the boat people is about is the boat people is the story of those people who try to who try to seek asylum but it's also the story of the people on the other side where we also see the side of the people who are trying to adjudicate these uh re refugee hearings you also get the 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 um the perspective of of the people who are who are representing the refugee claims as well so you get three points so um the first, the first the perspective that we're introduced to is Mahindan, who is one of the Sri Lankan refugees who are trying to claim status in Canada. He he is a single father with one child, and he lost his wife during the war. And the only reason why he's come to Canada is because he wants to give his son a better life. And then we have Priya, who is an up-and-coming lawyer. She's also of Sri Lankan Tamil roots, but she doesn't have... Like I wouldn't say she, like she. The thing is with Priya, she she's aware of her family history, but she doesn't have like the specific details. Like her parents don't like talking to her about what happened back in Sri Lanka, so she doesn't have that much knowledge of her family history. So she is an up and coming lawyer who is assigned to work on these cases representing the refugees, and then also have the story of Grace who is on the other side of this legal battle where she is going to be one of the people who decides whether the, the refugees get to stay or go. And Grace's story is interesting because she is Japanese Canadian. Her, her grandparents were actually part of the group of Japanese Canadians who were very impacted by World War II in Canada. They were part of the group of people who, you know, the, the government said like, you as Japanese cannot stay in BC anymore. We're going to put you in internment camps and you're gonna to have to stay there until the end of the war. And it's interesting to see how that, how that family history plays out in Grace's decision on whether or not she's gonna send these people back home or not. So those are the three main perspectives represented in the story. And I thought Sharon Bala did a really good job of just representing the whole aspect of what it means to be a refugee in Canada, how people in Canada react when people when people overseas try to come here and claim status. Um, I love this story. I thought I saw myself represented in this book. I thought I saw my family represented in this book. I thought it was very well written, very well researched. I was crying at a lot of times during this book, like it made me really, really sad. Just thinking about um, certain things that happened to this book so ha have exactly happened to like some family members. So this is like probably one of the best books that I've read since, since starting this book club. Um, Anika, what did you what did you think overall? I didn't like the ending, but overall, yeah, the ending was I did like it. Um, I liked Grace for a while, but then she kind of annoyed me. Uh, Priya, Priya, I liked, but I feel like the reasoning that she is the way she is is her parents' fault. Like, the, her not knowing how to speak Tamil 
and her not being connected culturally is her parents' fault because when she wanted to in high school get to know her her Tamil peers, they kept telling her no because they felt like it was too political, which is understandable because they didn't want they didn't want to be bringing any negativity to their family and they know how there was the whole political things going on before they came to Canada and obviously after. But yeah. It's, Do you uh, feel like you identified with Priya? Because of so because of what you were just saying right now, how she asked her parents if she could join the TSA at her school and they said no. So that happened to me in life. So I wanted to go to Tamil school when I was in grade five just so I could get like a better understanding of the language. And my mom said like, my mom pretty much said, no, you, you, we're not letting you go to Tamil school. You don't need to learn Tamil. Like there, it's no use for you here. And that was the first time something like that happened to me. But when I, when I also went to university, I wanted to join the TSA, the Tamil Student Association. And both my mom and dad were like, no, that's a waste of time. Those, those people are just gonna be troublemakers. You don't need to, you don't need to join with them. So I thought it was interesting that like, that seems like a very common experience among people who are like second, second generation, like among people who are born here that like there's this weird theme of like not being allowed to associate with other Tamil people because of how it would make you look in a way. I find it interesting also, though, that, that I find it interesting that your parents would say like, what do you need Tamil? You don't need to learn it when they speak Tamil to you. Like if you didn't need yeah. to learn it, they wouldn't yeah. speak it to you. Like they continue to speak to speak it to you in this day. Yeah. So I had this conversation with my mom a few a you a few years later, and she said that she didn't want us to learn Tamil because she thought it would hinder it would hinder us in the way that we speak English because she didn't want us to speak English with like a Tamil accent, and she thought that. Like, Wait, in grade were, five. Yeah, yeah. I don't think your don't language judge. is changing that late. Don't judge, but it, she thought that, you know, once we got out into the world that it would affect us when we were like looking for jobs or just how like the world would see us in the end with the way that we spoke English. Even um, we were having this conversation the other, the other day, I was telling you like, I, I'm the only one in my family who was born in Canada, but I speak better Tamil than my my brothers and it's because I I made the effort to try and learn despite, despite my parents not wanting to I mean but, yeah we had this discussion just yesterday about how I feel mm -hmm. about not only not only um Tamils but people in general the need that if you have a language to to speak it and teach it to your children like your child or any like any child how do okay in this day and age it is very frequent of a thing for a child to understand but not be able to speak and that is as i told you yesterday it's because a precedent isn't set like an expectation's not set you have to as a parent you have the power that when your child is little you speak to them in your language and they have they must speak back to you in the language if you just speak to them and you allow them to to respond to you in, in english then of course they're not going to learn how to speak it and it goes mm -hmm. as i told you yesterday like this is this is your culture this is your mother tongue and it goes beyond just you not wanting to speak it. Like this is your descendants, your, sorry, this is your ancestors. You don't want to be the reason that your language dies. Mm -hmm. And I know that you won't let Tamil die with your kids. No, my kids are going to Tamil school. They don't have a choice. I already decided it for them. <laughs> and in this, in this book, I found it, I found it odd how her brother was so embarrassed by his name that he changed it to Michael. But I like that she continued to call him Rat. Yeah. And I'm also like, that's a fairly common 
Tamil, Tamil name Lingaratnam, I, but I've never heard it shortened that way. I don't only mean Tamil, uh, sorry, I don't only mean refugees in this case, Divi. I, I mean like people who just immigrate to Canada. So like Spanish speakers, French speakers, the different places in Africa, or like if they came over here, not in a refugee type of way, it's just the kids feel some type of ways about speaking the language. Especially because I feel like in our society, certain languages are on a higher pedestal. So it's like, oh, if you, if you speak French, especially in Canada, like that's like above the above and beyond. But like maybe other languages, like perhaps Tamil, it's seen as like not as important or not as like good to speak because it's not going to take you to places. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's this weird connection that I was buying a book where in Sri Lanka, you could get killed for, for speaking Tamil. Like in certain situations, people have gotten, have, have gotten killed for speaking Tamil and not being able to speak the, the majority language. And then those people also immigrate to Canada so that their kids can grow up safely as Tamil kids, but then we lose the language. So in the end, it's still the same result, right? Oh, and I want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. People can be really, really mean too. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about with Priya, it's also because the, her her lack of awareness about her cultural identity is because of her parents. And it's because her parents were almost not willing to speak about things that had happened to them back home, right? Like it almost seemed like until until she had gotten assigned to this refugee case, that it almost like they they never spoke about what what went on back home. And I saw parallels between that and my own parents because my dad never talks about goes what goes on at home or uh, what what went back on at yeah, home. Like my dad has them. Both my parents have siblings passed away from the war, but they never ever talk about it. Only on the days where it's like a, an anniversary comes up, will they ever that like they have people lost in the war. But other than that, like my 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 understanding of my family history has come, always come from other people talking about it but not directly from my mom and dad and if they have it's always been like little little nuggets of like stories and whatnot but you see like, like that's like, not healthy practices. like especially because the war was something that was so big and it affected so many people a lot of people went through trauma and because of that, like a whole group of people, a whole generations of people need therapy, but they don't go through therapy. And that could be because culturally, like therapy is not a thing. Like a lot, a lot of people of color view therapy as like just for white people and that you don't tell other people your problems or what you've gone through. But like by not, by not sharing that with your own flesh and bl blood, your children, you're hindering them because trauma can be generational. You might not experience something, but you will be affected by trauma that your parents went through before you were even born. It's like passed mm -hmm. on. And like, if you don't, if, if your parents don't reveal that to you, you are not able to work through that. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a scene that happened in the book um, where Priya was talking about her childhood, how there was an assignment where um, they had to write about countries that are going through a war right now. And it, it was like an elementary school assignment. So she wanted to do Sri Lanka because of like the connection that she had to it. And she wanted to interview someone. She wanted to interview like a, um, her parents regarding for the assignment about their experiences. And they said, oh, don't do not do that. Like, you, that's not a good assignment for you. Why don't you go and talk to your mom's your mom's coworker who's like from Yugoslavia and you can talk about the, the conflict in Yugoslavia. So they were like direct, so they were directly diverting her to another topic instead of talking about their personal experiences. Especially because they were hiding, which we found out in the book when 
she herself was like, whatever age she is now, 20 something, her late twenties, she found out that her uncle who's been in her like immediate family, her whole life, basically mm -hmm. that he was a Tamil tiger. Mm -hmm. And even that, that, that scene as well, you could tell that that was the first time he was ever speaking about what had happened mm -hmm. to him and the way that it was coming out of him. It felt like it, it was almost like a release for him. Like it was the first time that he was talking about it at all. Like it, it seemed like it wasn't even something like he had spoken about with his brother. And, well, that's what I was gonna say. It seems like we always knew that there were ten that there was tension between Priya's dad and her uncle, and this is probably why, because mm -hmm. her dad was so like against all of this political stuff and not wanting her to to be associated with with that. And it's like his own brother was a Tamil tiger. Mm -hmm. But like his brother wasn't doing it because he was some political person. He was doing it for survival. Yeah, he was doing it for survival. And also he lived, like his brother left right around the time like the first conflict happened back in the 50s. But mm -hmm. then around the time that, what's his name? Ramesh got, got more active in this. It was a, around the time of like the 80s. The 80s of when it happened. happened. Like the Black July riots. So like that, like people were, like he, he was specifically targeted during that riot. And it's also because he got into, he, he got into a group of, of people who are also moving in the same direction of like being, being rebels, right? Which I feel like that's that that's what happens to a lot of these people who join in in who join in like groups like this, right? It's like what what else is there to do except fight back? Okay, let's jump into these questions. I don't know if these are the same questions in the back of your book. They might be. So I'll read the question. I'll read the the full question, and then we'll like break down the different parts. So, why do you think the author chose the boat people as her title? Throughout history, the term boat people has been used to refer to different waves of migrants. Who do you think the boat people of the title were going to be? What other examples of boat people are you aware of? Okay. Oh, I, 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 just going into it, I knew it was going to be, it was going to be yeah. about Sri Lankan people. But when we're talking about- Because we specifically, people, look, we, like when we were looking for books, yeah. we specifically we knew. like- yeah. We knew what we were getting into. And, and then yeah. I saw the name too, Sharon Bala. I'm like, yeah, I know who this is. <laughs> and But <laughs> um, apart from Sri Lankans, like another group of people in Canada who have been known as people are like the Vietnamese people. I think back in like the 70s or 80s, there was like a the civil war in Vietnam. And so a whole, a whole bunch of people got on boats and made entry into Canada to claim asylum. So I know they, they are also other people who have who've been known as uh, the boat people. Also, but like mm. when we, in, in just like a global sense of the word um, Syrians, Syrians have been known to get like, try and find freedom, safety through like these little rowboats, cargoes. Like that was the other story that we, that we read about. Too, yeah. With Alan, um, um, Alan Curdy. What was it called? What was it? Um, I, ha I literally have it right here. Um, sea prayer. The sea prayer, yeah. The sea prayer. Like that whole story was about him and his father getting on a boat to find freedom in in in, in Europe. I can't remember which country in Europe, but they tried and evidently like they didn't succeed because the boat topsized. I mean, we use the term very loosely and like in a comedic way on a daily basis because you and I always talk about fobs like mm -hmm. being fresh off the boat. Mm -hmm. I, they mentioned that term in the book too, how um, yeah. Grace's, Grace's mother, Kumi, was once called a fob when she was growing up in BC. Yeah, and, and she's was, like, I was born here. I was born here. Um, okay. What did you think about Mahindan? A he was a good line. father. He was a good father. He did what he could. I, as I said, I don't like how it ended because I don't know what's going to happen to him. I don't yeah, know so it, if he it, ends up like staying in Canada, if he's going to be deported. So it ends right at 
right when his um, admissibility hearing is about to begin. So his admissibility hearing is to determine whether or not he will be allowed to stay in Canada. Like he's he's already he's already staying in a prison right now. Most of the the passengers who were taken off the the boat were immediately directed to prisons to stay while their hearings were happening. But at this time, and the children were put into foster care. And then the children were put into foster care, which is what happened with uh, Mahindan's son, Seelan. So he was separated from Mahindan and placed into foster care with a, a white family. And I, I had I had several feelings about that as well. But um, I think at the end of it, Mahindan is one of the only people left in the prison waiting for his admiss admissibility hearing. And it's because of certain things that he had done for the LTT, the Tamil Tigers, who were like the top, the the main uh, rebel group in Sri Lanka during the Civil War. It, it was because of certain things that he had done for the LTT during the, the Civil War that he was kept in prison for that long because they kept thinking, saying that like, he's he's a risk to the he's a, he's a risk to the community. We can't let him go. We can't let him go. We're not sure if he's an actual terrorist or not. So it ends right when right when his disabilities hearing is about to start. And I thought, man, I want to know what happens to him. Exactly. And my thing is. Like his son is put into foster care and like he's doing, he's he's thriving. He's learning English, he's he's doing all the things. So if his father gets sent back, does that mean he's going to be sent too? Because he wasn't born here. Like if if his father stays and then does the whole permanent residency and then gets citizenship, then his son would automatically get that too. But if he gets deported, the son does the son stay? So in cases where this has happened in real life, it's the choice of the parent where they want to have the kids stay or take them back with them. And most of the time they let the kids stay. Like they'll, the, the government usually finds like a foster family oh. or like actual relatives. Tell us, Divi. Yeah, tell us, Divi. Also, did you just change your name on here or was it always like that? Sharanja? No, no Divi. No, 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 Divi. <laughs> no, it's always been like that. Divi Prasad, and actually there's a character. No, I swear it used to say Poovy. No, it's, it was Divi Prasad. Okay. There's a character in the book named Prasad, too. Yeah, first name. First name. Oh, by the way, Anika, when he says hi. I can barely see Winnie and I cannot even see you. <laughs> he's there. He's on the bed and he's looking. <laughs> okay, so well, Divi types that out. Uh -huh. Oh. Oh, another thing I want to say about. Yeah. That's what I Maybe thought. Maybe back on the boat. But that. I don't think that's true for now, though. I think they give the kid, the parent this choice if they want to stay, if they want to have the kid stay or not. Because then, okay, so if the if the child stays, then they that they and then they gain citizenship. Later down the road, can they sponsor that same parent that? Oh, you mean that the kids will go back with the parents, but if the kids are born here, they stay. Oh yeah, they can stay because they're citizens, but. Yeah, because I feel like what I just said, that is a reason why they would force them to take them back because it's like, if, if a country is going to deport you, they're not going to give you any other way to come back in so easily like that. So by keeping your child here and getting them citizenship where they can sponsor you back in a few years our country is shady and i wouldn't put it past them to to nip that in the bud i think that's how it was in the 90s it was a lot more tougher in the 90s it's it's extremely tough now but but i also just I think it depends on the reason why you get to, you got deported to i mean is there ever a good reason to be deported well, no, but there are there are reasons like 
like people who commit crimes here and they get deported for that reason. But then you get, you have like the, the situation I'm thinking about right now, there was a mother who had recently come from Sri Lanka like 10 years ago with her two kids. Um, and she was, she was coming here to re reunite with her husband. I don't know why her husband didn't sponsor her, sponsor her officially, but something happened. And so she took like the, like the smuggling route. And so she was able to stay in Canada for two years, but for whatever reason, her asylum claim got denied and she got sent back. And I think she's still, she's still like trying to fight the decision on her case, but her kids got to stay because they are staying with their father. But look, that but always baffles my mind how how hard it must be to be married, but to be apart. That was my parents for like the first three years of their marriage. My dad was here. My mom and dad were only together for like six months right after they got married. Then my dad had to come here. And then I think, no, no, they, my dad was married for like, I, with my mom for a year living together. And then he came here and then they spo he sponsored my mom and my two brothers. But like around the time he left, my mom was pregnant with my second brother. And so he- I was he gonna say, how, how did, how did, if, he, if they only lived together a year, how did the, both your brothers were born? Well, she was she was pregnant with my second brother around the time he left but then he didn't meet my my second brother at least until like he was like one or two until they had come here if i'm opening I mean, the door, is it your is it your isn't um sandosh only two years older than you yeah so then it has to have been oh, less Three years. He's three years older than me, and then Dinesh is four years. It happens. It's like it's what you gotta do if you wanna keep your family alive, right? Yeah. I mean, more so like longer than that, because then that you 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 one hundred percent know that someone's cheating. I'm not gonna say anything about that, but um. Um, like you can't tell me that a lot that that doesn't happen a lot that well, either somebody's here and cheating or somebody's down there and cheating you may think like that some that you that that you got your wife pregnant but that's not your baby i'm not gonna, et talk, I'm not gonna talk about that <laughs> um so i was doing some research on the actual case that happened in yeah. uh, in 2010 so all those people who were in like the detention facilities are out now, um, but some of them still have um, haven't even begun their their um, immigration hearings yet, right? So they're still they don't have status. They're just like stuck in limbo, and it's been like ten years. And um, some of them have like wives and kids back home that they haven't seen in ten years. Like the goal for them was to come here, get status, and then sponsor their kids to come over, right? but it's been 10 years. So some of them have like full blown, like 10 year old kids that they don't have a relationship with, right? It's not like you, when you're when you're in this like limbo status, you can't just like fly back home and come back, right? Yeah. I was gonna say, oh, so obviously I read a lot of this book in a rush. So clarify for me. <coughs> Did Mahindan cheat? No, sorry, it wouldn't be cheating because his wife's dead. No, he didn't. He didn't do anything with her. He decided that because I was very disturbed how it was saying that he felt he felt something in the pit of his stomach, and then he felt below his waist rising. I'm like, so you didn't have to say that. You didn't have Listen. to say how how her breasts were small but well rounded. Listen, he's a man, okay. <laughs> he's a man. Yes, but all this didn't need and to be said because the because because the book was written in third person, not first person. So I didn't need to know that. But uh he decided he wasn't gonna be that person who was gonna, you know, get this get this woman to have sex with him. He just told her, like, I'll give you fake I'll give you what you're what you want if you give me food, basically. And another and she thing was that we wicked from the beginning. And another thing that um, 
that we find out near the end of the book is is um one of Mahindan's secret was secrets was that he was selling fake documents to people before they were before they got on the boat so anyone who didn't have like appropriate documentation like id birth certificates he was selling he was selling documentations to them and th this documentation he found off the bodies of dead people in like well this that's grounds for having him deported in a way yeah when you look at it from like a black and white legal issue but in a, from a moral issue he was just doing what he had to to survive right that was the only way he was going to get money to afford that that uh, yeah to get, to get on the boat for both same of way with how he was like doing a whole bunch of um mechanical work and he found out that it was for the T tamil tigers how they put a bomb on the bus and whatever yeah yeah i mean it's you you can't blame you can't blame blame these it's people a it's a lottery it's a lottery like you can't blame them for doing what they have to do to survive right like what choice do what choice do you have really not nothing really because it's either death or that yeah it's death like, on one side and death on how, the other side how they described how his family was just there dead mm -hmm. like his family was blown up in a land in a in an air raid right near the end of the war and like think about all the mental trauma that you get from experiencing something like that yep Poor, poor Cillian. Okay, question two. Mm -hmm. Consider the book's epigraph by Martin Luther King Jr. We may have all come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. How does this epigraph relate to the plot or set the stage for the themes explored in the book? I love that, I love that quote. Um, well, there were parallels between Mahindan's story and the story of Grace's family, like how um, Grace Grace's Grace is a direct descendant of people who of Japanese people who were in internment camps in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And they were also people who, like you know, came here for a better life. Um, I think at one point Grace um, Grace also said like their their grandmother was referred to like her great grand grandmother came to Canada on a boat, right? so evidently they're also boat people and in a weird way like i don't know if you saw the, the the parallels the connections um i found it interesting like grace's viewpoint on the refugees on the sri lankan refugees because i found it terrible i found I was it terrible. disappointed in her yeah yeah like because because if it was like the 50s or the 60s then this conversation would be about like the Japanese Canadians, right? But like, and her mother was trying to explain this to her, but it still wasn't connecting. Like she kept thinking about what about public safety? What about the safety of my daughters? Like we have to, we have to like, we have to like treat that minority of people who could be terrorists as if they're the majority. We can't let one person through. And I thought yeah. that was interesting yeah. that she was approach, approaching it in that way. Like I thought we were supposed to treat people as if they were like innocent until proven guilty but her whole whole attitude was like guilty until proven innocent exactly like you no know, her even her twins were i feel like her twins understood it more than her mm -hmm. yeah because her her twins were getting like some of their education from their grandmother directly right it seemed like they were, they had that special bond where that, where, where it didn't exist between Grace and her own mother when it came to that whole, um, like, but yet Grace had her, had a relationship with her grandmother. Mm -hmm. But I, but it's also the same situation with Priya too, where I think that Grace's grandparents didn't really speak to her about what they went through. And I think it's only now with like, um, what's her name? With Kumi, her mom. With Kumi having Alzheimer's and deciding, like, I need to tell my family what I went through, what happened to us now before I completely forget. Like how she had to deed to the house. Mm -hmm. And she's like, all these all these white people are, are in the areas and they're changing everything up. When I was a child, you wouldn't find them over here. They, they'd say that that over here is dirty and, and that they're, too, they're too good for this area. Mm-hmm. 
I also want to talk It's just about, like gentrification. It's gentrification for sure. I like I also want to talk about how Grace got the got the job on the Immigration and Refugee Board uh, committee. So she had connections through her previous boss. Like her previous boss was a camp a cabinet minister for tra- transportation. Transport. And she had worked with him for like 10 years and then she said like I need she told him like I need something new. I need a change of scenery and so he he placed her on this board but it's also kind of like shady too because i think he's like trying to run for like higher office or something so he wants to have and this whole like this whole issue about the the tamils um coming coming in on the boat like it was becoming like a media like a media um frenzy right because a lot of people were for letting them in and also a lot of people were against letting them in and he this politician was on the the side of not letting them in and he wanted to make a, like a political a political statement out of them and he had and like his direction his direct connection to this case was grace right because he he was trying to influence grace to 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 judge them how he would want them to be judged right and then that's the thing too. So Grace was not a lawyer. She's not a judge, but yet she has this power to judge a situation like this with no previous law background or no previous background in doing this. Because as you said, she came from transport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was the point of like this. This was her first, her first like job, like the first thing that she's doing for this job title. Her first thing that she's judging under this. Mm -hmm. And that was a a point of a contention between her and one of her colleagues, right? The fact that he called her out and said, you don't, you don't have the experience to do this. Whereas like this person here has a master's in refugee studies. That guy over there worked for the UN for years. Like, Mm -hmm. like, like you're just like a tool that's being used by politicians to get, to influence this case one way or another. And ask like, and and this also directs to how, you know, the the society at the time were reacting to these people who come in. And it's always the same thing. Whenever a group of people come into the country seeking asylum, it's always like they're terrorists. Send them back. We don't want them here. There's not even enough jobs to go around for the people who were born here. Why do we want them? There's no room. It's like literally the same thing that happens no matter who, who it is that's coming into the country. It's the same rhetoric over and over again. Like this was this this case happened like ten years ago, but we heard the same conversation when when like the Syrians were being brought in. We don't want them here. They don't they don't belong here. They're terrorists. They, what about public safety? It's literally the same thing over and over again, and it's it always becomes a political issue, always. I mean, it's the reason why I think it's it's one of the plat it's one of the political pr- platforms that Justin Trudeau used to. To campaign on right during his first election like he used what to um, allowing refugees in or not allowing them? to allow them in uh i think it was like when was he first elected An- anika like 2016 it's been a long time like 2015 probably before that probably before that but around the time that he was elected it was around the time or, or around the time he was compa- campaigning it was like the, the height of the syrian refugee crisis and it was also like stories like alan Curdy that was that were literally um on every front of the every newspaper across the world and he made a statement saying i'm going to allow up to like a hundred thousand refugees into the country because this is canada we welcome refugees he he took office in 2015 2015 yeah yeah, so it was like one of the foundations of his his campaign. But honestly, I'm going to tell you why that probably happened. I don't think he took that as because that's what he I don't think he, he used that as a platform that he truly stood on it and believed in. I think he was basically jumping off of his dad because everybody loved Pierre Elliott Trudeau for his stance on bringing in immigrants. Like most of most of our parents came in under El- Pierre Elliott Trudeau because with him, like there was such an influx of, of immigrants because he allowed it. As with other people, they didn't really want the immigrants. So I think that 
the reason why Justin got in was because it's a lot of people who loved his dad. So it's based off of the name. And then he's he kind of using the same platform. He was also good looking. Too. You don't you don't elect somebody for the good looks. This is not high school. Well, there are some people who would. <laughs> this is not high school. Because because look now everybody is hating on on Trudeau because he's not running the country that well. Mm-hmm. And same thing goes with with Doug Ford. He was he was he was elected based off of people liking his brother and that name. Mm-hmm. Doug Ford is not that great of a guy. I personally didn't like like Rob Ford. He made a mockery of the city of Toronto, but I guess that he did more good for his own name. The thing is a lot of, you know why a lot of people like liked Rob Ford? It's because he had he had like a phone line where like people in his his community could directly call and like get get him to like help on certain issues mm-hmm. like he was very available to all his people in his writing i mean that being said he was just a mayor and his brother is now the premier mm-hmm. and with this whole covid thing like a lot is on his shoulders yeah. but, but when he first got elected when he's talking about his bs about beer wh- about dollar beer how is that your platform that you're going to offer you're making um, a mockery of our profits. Anika, let, you just triggered a memory. So, so around the time that the NB Sensi incident happened, Rob Ford was a mayor at that time. And you know the statement. The crack released, thing? No, you know the statement that Rob Ford released about the the Sunsi, about the Tamil refugees? He said, I mean, they're more than welcome to come to Canada, but they're not going to be coming to Toronto. They shouldn't come to Toronto. We don't have space for them. He said that. That was an actual statement that he said. <laughs> Yo, and you know what actually makes this funnier? So obviously, okay, when you're a kid, you basically you have you have a schema or whatever. So you learn the you learn about your world based on what you experience. So you learn like a a dog is a dog because this or this and this like. A cow is a cow because this or this or this. So as a kid, especially, you know, the area that we grew up with, Tamils everywhere. So I always knew like Tamil people and like, okay, like Tamil people are from Sri Lanka. So in my head, I always, I always associated Tamils with Sri Lanka, never with like the Sinhalese or whatever, because I didn't know any of them. I knew all Tamils. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's funny that he would say that because like Toronto, especially Scarborough, has a huge, a huge Tamil community. It it definitely made him lose points with the community for sure. I also want to say with the Doug Ford family, if they have, they're a political family, like their their father was a premier, former premier in Ontario to Mike Ford. And he was like very, a very popular um, conservative premier for like, Eight, like he he won both elections too so both of them benefited from the father as well um and they're continuing that legacy of like a political family because i think the nephew doc doug um uh, his the, yeah, the nephew, nephew the, the nephew is was is not a ford because his mother is a ford but because of the whole ford name he changed it yeah so he's using the name for for political purposes. For political purposes. But yeah, like it's interesting to see how the how it filters down to each generation, right? Um, I think he even ran in Doug Ford's or Rob Ford's old old writing, so it's like a Ford problem that he's privil- that he's working in. Um, but yeah, yeah, Ro- Rob Ford really did say say that about the refugee world. <laughs> me too. Me too. Me too, Divi. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> you say this, but watch him get in again. Because even the people who voted Listen, for him, tragic. Don't the like same him. way that the whole, the same way that the whole world was scared that that um, Trump was going to get in again, we are all going to be scared that he gets in again. You're going to see me on the street riding then. Okay, the novel is told through the perspectives of three characters, Priya, Grace, and Mahindan, both in the present and in the past. 
What do you think the reader gains by having access to these different points of views? What do each of these perspectives bring to the story? Whose story did you enjoy most and whose story surprised you the most? Grace's surprised me the most because I did not expect I did not expect her to, to be so pickheaded. Honestly, I loved having the three the three perspectives represented because I feel like I could understand the whole issue of what like the refugee like of what being like a refugee means so much better by having all three sides of the the legal the legal argument represented right because Priya's like she's like on the side of the refugees Mahindan is the refugee so he's like the one who's most directly affected by the decision uh that Grace comes out with and Grace is like on the on the side of against them right and I have to say that out of everyone that I I enjoyed Priya Priya the most right because you could see this beautiful journey of her you know finding out her family history slowly changing her career her career direction because before she wanted to be on like she wanted corporate. to be a corporate lawyer but because um this whole refugee case happening the firm decided that because she's Sri Lankan not knowing that she didn't speak any Tamil at all they wanted her to be on this this case right and then she she initially fought it so much she's just like I don't I don't know what I'm doing I don't I don't want to have anything to do with this but then coming to like meeting the people who are like trying to seek asylum and just like it causing her to like ask questions about her own family history. I love that story. And then the, the, the one that surprised me the most would be like, like Anika said, Grace, because I've just felt so not disappointed in her, in, in, in the writing of her story. I, I felt disappointed in her as a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fact that she couldn't draw connections between her own personal family his history and the things that these people are going through considering you're also a person who's like an immigrant you're you're a person who like whose family members came here for a better life but and there were direct things that happened because of what the government did to you like the fact that they made you that you, they made your family move to internment camps for like three years and that was something the Canadian government did and but you couldn't you couldn't sympathize you couldn't empathize with these people you kept seeing them as terrorists or like another thing that annoyed me so much about her is the fact that she took so many things as a direct as a direct uh, threat to her daughters like bringing these people is like oh what about the future of my daughters like this has nothing to do with your kids no she like <sighs> Reading her story, I'm like, are my children going to be so far disconnected like this woman? Because essentially, you and I would be like her mom. We were the first generation to be born in this country. And then she would be like our child, our child. Like, I cannot raise my child to be like this. Like, you're going to, I don't care how old you are, you're going to get a hot slap and I'm going to get some sense into your head if you're going to. But to it's, believe such things. Don't Nonsense. You think, don't you think it has also something to do with a false sense of entitlement? The fact that she thinks that just because she's a Canadian that she has the same rights and yes. as everyone else, but she doesn't realize it's a false sense of entitlement because the government can take that away from you at any time. Like her mother, her mother was also a born Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. And look at what the government did to their family. Who's to say that one day, like, I think this was also mentioned in the book as well. Like, who's to say that one day the government d decides that, like, you're, you know what, you're, you're not a citizen anymore. You're an enemy of the state. We're going to put you all into this one little area. You have to give up your freedom. You have to give up your belongings. And just because we say so. Right? Honestly, in my head, the, my, my true belief is that we are, none of us are safe because if our country can treat the indigenous people to this land, the way that they treat them, we're not safe, none of us. Because mm -hmm. we're just immigrants. Our parents immigrated here. We're first generation. But if people who have whose families have been here from the beginning of time and they're being treated like this, Grace needs to get a clue. I need to look up for this bill. Stephen, Har Stephen Harper did a lot of shady things. Mm hmm I say this all the time. No politician is free of flaws. 
politicians are all evil, all wicked in some type of way. They all have something to hide. They all have something to hide, but and they also have a very clever way of hiding their shadiness. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so much that goes on underneath, like the surface that we don't even, we're not even aware and that we don't even have access to. I'm not saying like everything's like a conspiracy theory, but wow, like the amount of information that we don't have access to is crazy. Oh, this one's a good question. Examine the relationships between parents and their children in the book. How would you characterize these relationships? What does being a parent mean to Mahindan, Grace, Kumi, Appa, and Hima? What sacrifices have these parents made for their children? Discuss the expectations the parents have for their children. So how would you characterize these? I think Mahindan and um, Selian, they have a great relationship. Well, sorry, they had a great relationship, but obviously it's more strained because he's being raised by a foster family right now. And like, he's a typical child. He, he has tantrums and he doesn't fully understand what's going on. Like he just wants his dad to go outside and watch him play. Yeah, and uh, he, he must also be going through that tr- already. Mm-hmm. And then Grace and Kumi. You already know how I feel about Grace. <laughs> did like, you uh, Kumi, did you read that? Kumi has some some Kumi has some issues. But like, it's also, she has Alzheimer's. Like when you get, when you have Alzheimer's, you're not yourself 100%. -hmm. Like you, you act out and you can be mean and stuff, but like, that's just the illness talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She has no control over it. Yeah. Um, Did you, do you remember reading the section where Grace is trying to tell her mom about what she does in her job and how like. The sta- she pretty much made this comment about like, oh, the safety of Canada re- lies on When her mom, her mom said something about like, I don't care, or like, you're not, I don't care about your job, or you're not, you're nothing, or something like that. No, she, she said something like, relax, relax, Grace, you're not that important. <laughs> yeah, something like that. I'm just like, oh. Which brings and- it back to, it's like, Grace, you really aren't, you're not a lawyer, you're not a judge. Yeah. Like, you're, you're just this, you're just this kind of insignificant person who is yield who's holding some power and it's making you go insane Mm -hmm. yeah she definitely she definitely had the job built up in her head and i have a i have a feeling it's because of the the cabinet minister behind her as well trying to like make her make her into one of his like little buddies on the the committee right oh and who is her husband or whatever steve is he white yeah i have a feeling he's white I think, no, he's white. He's white. <laughs> and I, but the thing is, I didn't really, I, it's, it, maybe it has something to do with me. I just assumed that he was Japanese like her as well until. At first comment, I did. Yeah. Until a comment on uh, Kumi made being like, you're Canadian in a way that we're, we could never be like, look at who you marry. Look at who you, who your friends are. So I'm like, oh, he must, she must be mean that her husband is white. That and I think also when when Kumi was in one of her her like um, Alzheimer's fits, she had said something about him. Yeah, like you, you look like the man who took who took my family away. Yeah, or like yeah. something like that. Also, mm-hmm. I should have known it, but I should have known it from earlier when Grace's daughters were asking for all those stuff. I'm like, mm-hmm, that's very white behavior. No comment. The, especially the stuff they're asking for. The no. sandals. No comment. <laughs> I thought um, Mahindan and Seelan's uh, father-son story was one of the the more like heartbreaking aspects of the whole book. The fact that like Mahindan was at that point pretty much living his whole life for Seelan, right? Like that was the whole reason for him coming to Canada so Seelan could have a better mm-hmm. life. Um, what sacrifices have they made? So he basically sacrificed his whole life for his son. Mm -hmm. And his wife's life was sacrificed. 
Yeah. Well, she, her, his, so his wife passed away in, in child labor, but it's, it's like being at a hospital in a, in a war zone, right? If she was anywhere else, they would have been able to save her just fine. But because they were lacking so much medical equipment and medication that she just ended up bleeding out. And that's or, happened or to so care. many people. Because if this is all happening, it's like, why would they want to, to save a Tamil person? It's just like they do what they can, right? But when you don't have access to the, the, the equipment that you need in these type of situations, like what can you do? Or like, okay, another thing I noticed in this book is, you know, when you're a kid and you're playing, especially when you're playing like, um, like shooting and stuff, and you just say things in the book, Silly Selian had was playing some game and he's like, oh, we're going to rape, we're going to rape your, your wives and we're going to eat your, your Tamil babies. And it's like, you don't realize what you're saying, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like you might not you might not understand what rape is, but like you know you're Tamil. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like it's like parroting, right? They're just parroting something. Exactly from what they're they're here because he's he's grown he was born and grew up in mm -hmm. that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about um how his Dylan and Mahindan were separated and I, it, at first, Seelan was put in another detention facility in the women's facility, and he was supposed to be looked after by um, one of Mahindan's like former uh, friends in that in the women's facility. And then they decided that I think Grace was the one who made the decision that uh, Seelan was going to be taken out and placed with a foster family. White family. And like, it, it just like broke my heart. <laughs> And like all this time spent away from from your child, and then to have him be placed in an environment with a group of people who, you know, they might be the loveliest people, but it, it's nowhere near the same as being with people who are who, who have gone through some, some things similar to you and can speak your language. Because at this point, Dylan couldn't speak any English, so he also there was the language barrier, cultural barrier, and on top of that, he had to start new a school. He, he had to start a new school without his father being there. So all these traumas happening out to this one little kid. And I feel like that wasn't properly like expanded upon. I feel like Seelan could have been his own character, like had his, had his own pop. And then even towards the end of the book, when you see him with Charlie and Priya, his dad is like, I wish that, I wish that like that would be his family. Cause Charlie, speaks tamil mm -hmm. like, and they it's like so they look like they belong together mm -hmm. i really like Char charlie as a character i thought she was a nice addition to the story what made me laugh at the beginning was when priya first went to the the meeting and then the translator was a white guy with blonde hair and blue eyes and yeah. she was so surprised to see him speak in proper, like, unaccented Tamil, and she can't speak it at all. I think she said she was a little bit jealous of him. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, too, because then you you, ha you do see, like, um, these, like, non-Tamil people having the ability to speak it, and they're super fluent. And then you're just like, I've had more exposure to the language than them. And because they had the... the, the willingness to learn it, they're at, they're at a level higher than higher than us. Mm -hmm. When I read that, I just thought about, like, Shreja always says that she wishes I could speak Tamil so we can talk about people. But I'm like, that'd be the time where she talk about somebody and they understand and they speak yeah. right back. But I'm I'm smart, though. I, I, I will make I'll try to make sure that they don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you wouldn't know. No, you never know. With a man like that. Even that, my mom and dad do that all the time where like they're outside and then someone does something in front of them and they start talking about them in Tamil. And I'm, all, I'm always like, mom and dad, you don't know if he speaks Tamil or not. This is Scarborough. Like, exactly. Exactly. So what was it that, that, that YouTube video we were watching yesterday with Lily Singh and Maitre? From yes. <laughs> um millennials versus gen z yeah that was really funny if you guys have time go and watch that video but at the end uh lily says something in tamil she says like shut up in tamil and then Mitri was like that's like one of the only words i know and i'm like 
girl. <laughs> no, she 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 had said something back. She'd said another word back in Tamil, and then Lily turned back, and then she was like, "Yeah, that's the only word I know in Tamil." <laughs> You pick things up. <laughs> That's like at work before. Like, there's some people who who speak Tamil and they're saying stuff to each other, and then like I like looked up one time and smiled. And they're like, "Oh, you speak Tamil?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> you should have just been. You should have just said yes and been like, "Yeah." What are you but then they'd me? speak to me all the time. <laughs> they would speak to me all the time in it. They'd be like, "Eh." <laughs> Let's see. Um, Kumi is suffering from Alzheimer's. In what ways does her illness reflect some of the book's themes? Um, off the top of my head, I, I, she has this whole thing where she's trying to like preserve her history. Like she, it's like two things. She, like she's trying to educate her granddaughters about what her family went through in the internment camps. But she's also trying to get other people to speak out too. I think there was like a scene where um, she was getting her granddaughters to like hand out like put up flyers. Yes, Divi. <laughs> and, uh, I'm just laughing at their names, Lucky and Vanilla. But yeah. um, but yeah, there was a scene where she was putting up flyers in like a laundromat, and I think near the end of the book they were talking about how uh, the BC government was going to put up a plaque in honor of uh, the Japanese can Canadians who lost their their homes and their livelihoods during World War II, right? So it seems like she was doing the most she could before her memory completely disappeared. Or I think another thing is how they keep going to the past. So like that could be something mm -hmm. too, because obviously when you have Alzheimer's, you kind of like relive the past mm -hmm. or you forget the present. Like you're you you act as if you're like reliving the past, right? Like you're yeah. in, you're in it. Yeah. Okay. On page fifty four, Priya recognizes Charlie as someone both fluently Canadian and authentically Sri Lankan, one of those third culture people who slipped in and out of of identities like shoes. How does Priya feel about her own ability to negotiate bef between her two identities? How does this compare with how Priya is viewed by her Sri Lankan clients? So I feel like Priya feels that she does not have that ability. Like there is no two identities. She only has the one. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of like, like obviously you're, you're very much like a Tamil person, you speak it at home. But when you went to Sri Lanka, you said that you felt like you weren't Tamil. Like people, people so know I, that you're a foreigner. No, so they knew I was Sri Lanka. I had a different experience than like that of my cousins because my cousins, when they went there, when they, when we were there together at the same time, people approached them speaking English. Whereas with me, people just approached me speaking, speaking Tamil. Tamil. And I even had one of my aunts there come up to me and say, like, they look like they're Canadian, but you look like you're one of us. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> Maybe because they're too bougie. I ha yeah, it's 100%. They were, they were too bougie. <laughs> there. But, like, it was also just, like, my f how I felt there is because I felt embarrassed because I wasn't speaking Tamil in a fluent way. But I was trying, right? Like mm -hmm. I would stumble a lot over words and I wouldn't know like the vocab for something, but I was doing a lot more than like my cousins. Your cousins. <laughs> yeah. And I also had a feeling it had to do with my clothing too, because I was covered up. Even though it's a hot country, I'm like, I don't want That's how you are all the time. Yeah. I was People like covered there up. Watching I was like wearing... summertime and I'll always turn to Shranj. I'm like, Shranj, aren't but you, you know, hot? Listen, you know what I was doing there? I was wearing like long skirts and then tights underneath that. And then I wore these. You want heat here. stroke? Like, I was covered, and then my I I wore like high neck and everything. You want heat stroke? But I also didn't want to show show too much skin there because I, there's um there's an issue with random guys coming up to you and making inappropriate comments. 
So I I just dress like Shad, how. If you're wearing a long skirt, you don't think that that's enough. Listen, I I didn't have anyone bother me. Even like I wore sol I wore salwars there. My my cousins didn't do that. Like my ca- cousins just went around with jeans and shirts, and that's fine for them. But I I mm-hmm. I dressed up to blend in basically. Mm-hmm. So people came up to me like, if you saw me with like a like a salwar and like just dressed traditionally, you're not gonna think I'm Canadian there. You're just gonna think I'm Sri Lankan. So I had people coming up to me <laughs> when I went to the store like, oh, you want to buy this? They were all like talking to me in Tamil like like they were trying to haggle, and I'm like, oh. Okay. But no one did that for them. Yeah, probably because for them, they'll just rip them off. It's like, oh, you're a foreigner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they always start at the Pay highest this. price. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Uh, I do, I, 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 I've told you this once before. I sometimes feel like a fob here. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like a fob sometimes. <laughs> How so? When I'm at home, it's like you're in Sri Lanka. Like certain things that like have been installed in me, it's almost like I I was born there and I came here, but I was born here. But like when I leave my house, I have to put on another identity where it's like I can't I can't be the way that I'm at home, right? Or even when I'm not with people who are Tamil, like you know, in our community, the way that you address older people, it's or like older people in your family you always say their name plus like akka or anna or like like there's like a, like a specific honorific that you use right mm-hmm. but i if i'm going out into the workplace or if i'm like meeting people that are not my family i don't do that yeah yeah i feel you with that but like it's not the same but it's kind of reminds me of so when you're a kid or I should say when I was a kid, because my parent, my mom specifically is very traditional in that you should not be a child and addressing somebody older than you by their name. You're either going to say miss, mister, auntie, or uncle. You're not, no, no three-year-old is going to be calling you Sharanja. It's auntie Sharanja mm-hmm. or something. But then it's like, obviously when you go in the workplace, the workforce, and you're like, your coworkers are that much older than you. You're just calling them by your name, by their name. So it's just like, it feels weird or it feels weird to like call people's parents by their name and not like Mr. or Mrs. or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. But like, it's very much a cultural thing because white people, a lot of white people, they just say whatever. They they'll call their parents by their their first name or their actual blood relatives or their aunts or uncles, like their parents, brother and sister, they'll just call by their name. Mm -hmm. And that's just weird to me. When we're having like conversations about like day-to-day life out at like work or in the, just like a social setting, there are things that people from a different community will say that I, I won't be able to relate to or connect with because that's just not things that like, Tamil people do right like one thing is like camping <laughs> shut up what's wrong with you I don't know I can use that as an example because um um so I went out I, I've been out I, I love camping I go camping all the time well not all the time a few times but um my mom was like I don't understand why you do that like in Sri Lanka we didn't have a choice when it came to living like that we had to live like that in tents when like bombs were being dropped on us but you're making the choice to do that no, I was saying this the other day. I'm like, why is it that white people love camping? And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going camping. Oh, we're going camping. But they'll look down on homeless people living in tents. They'll totally rip down their tent cities. And they'll they'll protest and they'll say stuff about people in their tent cities. But you out here going camping for fun? Yeah, yeah. And it's not our problem? Yeah, it's that's like a that's that's like got different issues. <laughs> um, yeah. Or like you're that- you're you're out here camping. You're out here camping in the woods. But I seen a few like when I was in my teens, I seen a person like a homeless person had their set up their their tent in the woods, mm-hmm. and they'll be called a transient. It's not camping. It's transient li- transient living. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Make it make sense. 
Look at what Greg wrote, though. That's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, I forgot you were even here. I didn't hear from you in time. Um, another thing is, like, a lot of, like, South Asian com communities, um, divorce isn't really a it exists, but it's not as common as like in other communities in North America, right? So most of the time, like you grow up in the same, you grow up with your parents, like in one household, right? So that's like not a conversation that, <laughs> that um you, you would know to have with other people, right? Like yeah, your family is intact, basically. Here, the, there's being a child, of divorced parents is more common than your parents staying together. Mm -hmm. Even just like the conversations about like family relations to a lot of like, in a lot of like South Asian cultures, especially Sri Lankan cultures, your family comes before your friends. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of people were like growing up, they would go to their friend's house all the time or they would go on vacations, trips with their friends or just like after school, hang out with your friends, right? I didn't have that. Most people, mo most Sri Lankan Tamil people don't have that they 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 whenever whenever we want to go out it's always like go out with your cousins go to your cousin's house like like play with your cousins no, none of this friend stuff like like for you for you people in the comments let us put us into perspective Shranja and I have been friends since grade nine we've been best friends so I could pro we could probably count the amount of times on our hands how much times we actually like hung out outside of school during high school. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly like, let's say like Shranch's birthday. Yeah. Or or like something like that. And like it even, didn't happen until like grade 12 or grade 11. Well, like for your like we, for your birthday, like, no, okay, like for, we would, before then we would like come over to your house. Yeah, or we would But that wasn't, but, but that, but we didn't walk home a lot because like mm -hmm. that, our parents didn't want back. that happening. Yeah, we would get back to that. Yeah. Or like us us like going over to each other's houses wasn't a thing because like that's just culture. Mm -hmm. like like you, even there's there's none of this like playing outside with your friends like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, another thing I um, want to mention. So like there isn't a concept of like dating in Tamil households like mm -hmm. I know like a lot of people get, they get their first relationship when they're in high school right and like it's a pretty normal thing it's a very normalized thing to like have your first boyfriend first first kiss in high school but in like Sri Lankan cultures like it's still like very very uh, stigmatized that like you, you're not allowed to do stuff like that especially if you're a girl no way no 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 you don't or if you do stuff like that and you're caught you're gonna get labeled you're gonna get a bad reputation in the community right so it's very common that like a lot of people don't find their first boyfriend they first of all they don't find a first boyfriend their parents find them a match to <laughs> but yeah like dating isn't a thing so like you won't you that's not really a conversation that you can have outside of your your community yeah so it's like it's like different it's like i don't know it's weird having to like navigate these type of conversations when when you're in a pred predominantly like non non poc yeah. environment like it's it's hard especially as being a kid and teenager navigating Like, you're trying to navigate a space that's not meant for you. Or, like, that's not allowed for you. Because, like, we weren't... Like, after going to university and hearing, like, what, what the other kids did in high school, like, we never just went to the mall for the sake of going to the mall. Mm -hmm. Like, my mom would be like, you're going... You don't have money. What are you going to the mall for? To walk around? Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, that's wasting time. Like, that's not being productive. Or, like, mm -hmm. we wouldn't just go out to go to McDonald's like what are you doing loitering at McDonald's mm -hmm. like yeah our time spent together was very intentional like mm -hmm. we're doing something even even like when I came home for weekends or for breaks from from university you and I were very intentional with what we would do when we'd hang out be like we're going for a hike we're going to make some random music video. <laughs> Don't talk about 
<laughs> we were like, we were never the kids to just be hanging out and sitting on a couch. Yeah, we always doing nothing. Jogging, running, like yeah. adventures and whatnot. But it like, even if to... we were playing video games, it was like just dance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we were never given the opportunity just to go and hang out at, at like Tim's and McDonald's just to chill, right? Like it always yeah. had to be like, because then it, it it would always be this conversation in our parents' mind, like, like that's giving opportunity for bad things to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. So things like that. It's, uh, <laughs> I think there was only one Greg. No, Greg doesn't need <laughs> to see it. <laughs> no. I'm surprised he hasn't seen it yet. How would he see it? Did you Unless it I showed it to him. Did you take it off Facebook? Was it on Facebook? I swear it was. <gasps> it's on my Facebook. <laughs> I know it was I on YouTube. It. No. Well, but it's it's set to private, I think, or unlisted. Good, good. good, job. good <laughs> job. I don't want my employer seeing that. <laughs> oh my, yeah. Yeah, it's the you you almost have to modify your modify the way you act when you're around certain people, right? Or like I feel like having parents like this creates very secretive children. Cause I remember when you and I had planned for you to come visit me up at school, and then at the very last minute is when you told your parents. Oh, you're calling me out. <laughs> Call and I had to I had to come with you in order for it to be okay. Like up until the day we were leaving, you're still scared that they would say no. Wasn't it that they called like right before we were going to the club and I had to make a lie? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, not my finest moment, but I had a good weekend. <laughs> it's hidden. It's hidden. <laughs> but yeah. Oh man, yeah, I love this story though. Very good, book. very good conversations. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, Anika, are there any topics we didn't cover yet? Let me I see. Um... Ooh, I found out an interesting fact. I found out that the, the, the author, Sharon Bala, she actually lives in St. John's, Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because one of the first boats that of Tamil people that that ever like came to Canada and to seek refuge was off the coast of Newfoundland. So I'm wondering if she's directly related to one of those people. This says on page 105, Grace and her daughters review the Japanese terms Issei, Nisei, Sansei, and Yonsei. Literally first, second, third, and fourth generation. Priya and her brother, Rat, or Michael, are first-generation Canadians, while Grace is a third-generation Canadian. Yet, despite being born... Hold on. How is Priya first-gen, but Grace is third? Because uh, her, gr her grandparents came to Canada, so they're considered first-generation, and then her... So then her wouldn't Priya's... Wouldn't Priya's parents be considered first generation then? Yeah, and then Priya's second generation. No, but it's saying Priya and her brother are first generation, while Grace yeah. is third generation. Maybe the maybe um, because they're referring to like a Japanese way of like counting the generations, right? Maybe it's like one generation off in the way that they count. Um. So yet, despite being born in Canada, they have their moments of cultural conflict. Examine these instances as possible. First generation Canadians, how do you think Hima's daughters, Tara and Padmini and Cillian, will fare in the future? I think they'll adapt really quickly. I can't I can't say I can't I feel like the the two girls would will adapt just fine, but I I'm still like up in the air about Celian because I feel like there's there's things there that like the book didn't tap into yet. I 
think I do. What do you think? What do you think is a model migrant? Oh. Like in your eyes, what would you consider a model migrant? Mm. That's a hard question, actually. Then it says, over the course of the novel, we learn of the morally ambiguous choices made by Mahindan and Uncle Ramesh. What would you have done? How did you feel about the comparisons Mahindan makes on page 146? Well, the book gave, I think the book gave the just that, that model, model migrant title to Prasad, right? Like they were yeah, saying, so like, and Prasad I think, is like, I think a model migrant in their eyes would be somebody who would assimilate more. So with him, he already could speak English, and he is on his way to speaking Canadian English as opposed to Sri Lankan English, mm -hmm. and he's willing to do what he has to in order to fit into the box of being a Canadian. I mean, like, if it's asking for my personal definition of what a model migrant would be, I just I would just say that it's someone who's just willing to work hard, you know, who's not here coming here just to like game the system, you know, work hard, contribute, you know, build a peaceful family life, add something to com the community. Like, they don't have to they don't have to be as educated or as um, fluent in English as Prasad, but because you know, those are things you could learn on the way. But like, yeah, just like hardworking, not a troublemaker. Um, I don't know, because even with my parents, I don't think none of no one in my family who came in the route that uh, Mahindan did, none of them would be considered model mig migrants because they didn't have degrees. They they barely spoke English. So, but they all had this ability ability to work hard, right? Like from the ground up, build something for themselves. So, I guess like I would I would say that that. That would be my definition of like a model migrant. That's a hard question. It is. Especially like, I don't know, cause it just makes you think like what a model person would be. And then how, no matter how you want your own family to fit in that box, how they might not. Because if you think about it, okay, what's the difference? Like a model student is like the greatest student. It doesn't matter how hard you work or like how, how much hours of studying you put into it. At the end of the day, if you don't make the mark, you're not a model student. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like if you're, for some this way, it's like our parents or even us, we could try our best. You could go the route of doing education or you could like go the route of just like trying to be a good person. But like if you don't meet somebody else's standard, then you're you'll never be that model. And we also have to ask who like if there? you don't completely assimilate, basically if you don't completely assimilate, then it's like you're not that model. Migrant. But we also have to ask whose standard are we trying to meet? Exactly. Right? That's the thing. And it's the people who don't really belong in this list. Yeah. Because even like, they're immigrants they, too. Like they actually do look at the fact that whether or not how well you can speak English, well, like that factors yeah, well, into whether when you whether take you your citizenship, you have yeah. to pass your English standardized English, yeah. test with a certain mark. Because I've known people who didn't pass it and they had to like go back and like do it. Yeah, even when you're like applying for PR, like like English, like speaking English is like counts towards like points towards getting your PR, right? Mm -hmm. but like but like english is not this is going to be like a repeated argument english is not the 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 original language of this country like it would it would have been like whatever language the indigenous people were speaking at that time and there were very yeah, many and there's yeah exactly so there's not one yeah and i don't think the indigenous people back then were saying like you got to learn our language in order to stay here no they adapted <laughs> Hold on, one sec, just gotta put this guy on the bed. <laughs> Little Winnie. 
But yeah, it's a very like colonial, colonial um, method of eliminating people who can come into the country or not. Has your perspective on immigrants and refugees changed after reading this book? Is there anything you now see differently? Well, my perspective on the actual re refugees haven't changed, but I think my perspective on the other side has changed. Like the people who actually go in and judge these cases, that's changed m my perspective a little bit. Because I, 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 before for I was the, even... For like the good or the bad, like it's changed your, your perspective for good or bad. Because as we've already said, Grace... Well... <sighs> Grace is not graceful. Grace is not graceful at all. I, I, if I were to be truthful, I think it did worsen my, my, my opinion on the other side. Just the fact that, like, you could be someone who doesn't have any credentials to be working in a in an environment in an environment where you're allowing people to stay in the country or not. Like, you, you could be just anyone apparently, as long as you have the right con connections. Exactly, because then it's like it's not it's not unbiased. And who are you to be having all these individuals' lives mm -hmm. in your hands? Mm -hmm. At least if you're a lawyer and a judge, you've done schooling, you've do you have the proper accreditation to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. This is some transit worker. Mm -hmm. It also made me want to research more on the process of allowing people into the country because... At, this, at before, like my understanding when my parents came here, my dad got off the flight and he was able to get a asylum, a, an asylum meeting right away with the uh, the customs and border officer. Like he got the hearing right away. But like as you were reading in the book, they they had they they had gone through like many 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 hearings, many meetings, right? And mm -hmm. also like they were being taken to uh, they were taken to a, det a detention facility, right? Like that was the thing when my my family came here in like the eighties and nineties, um. So I just wanted to learn more. Like, why do we treat them like what? Like some of the people that were like led led to the detention in like cuffs, right? I like, think that the reason why would be because it was it was so many people coming in at once because they're on that that cargo boat, and two, this is. This book was based off of what happened in 2010, right? Mm -hmm. Well, since 9-11 and, and all that stuff happened, countries all over have really become strict on who they let in in regards to, like, everything's terrorism. So that's mm -hmm. probably why they were more, like, hardcore. Yeah. As opposed to when your dad came. But it's interesting because when you think about all like the domestic terrorism that has happened in the country, a lot of mm -hmm. the time it's not it's not the people who come from outside the country who do that. It's like homegrown yeah. people. Like, wasn't it just last year, Anika, that we had like that mass wide shooting in Nova Scotia where this random guy just like shot up to like twenty people? It was either last year or the year before, like the, where the guy got the the um was it the mounty uniform the mount he stole yeah the he mount stole he stole some kind of uniform and he just shot up the place yeah and he, he was like homegrown like a canadian and then the the other incident where the shooter went into the capital the capital build, building in ottawa and he killed he killed the um the the, the soldier that was stationed right outside the building do you remember that one i don't remember um, that one um, it was like the first time like a soldier had been killed on Capitol Hill in like years and years and years. But that was all, another homegrown person who did that. I mean, like, I'm just trying to say that, like. That oh, don't forget you know, all of that, that domestic terrorism that was happening there in the States. And it's just like swept under the rug. All those people rug. who went into the White House. Mm hmm yeah oh yeah that yeah that was that was very very interesting and yet i don't th like the right-wing media is not like label labeling them as terrorists they're like oh they're they're like martyrs they're patriots 
Oh, and just like something that happened in Toronto too, like the car, like the van attack. Oh That's yes, that was a few years ago. That was a few years ago. I think we just had like the five year anniversary for it or something. But that guy was also homegrown too. Mm -hmm. Like people are just sick. People are just sick. Oh, and people I got are another people one. are leaving countries that have war to try and give themselves and their family a better life. And then there's people here who are just ending people's lives. Mm -hmm. Who who get access to guns and then do these mass mass wide shootings like the Ecole de Ecole de Polytechnique, the the, oh, the yeah. university oh. ship shooting twenty years ago. Yeah, or thirty oh. years ago. But that guy was homegrown too, and he got a gun and shot up all those all those women. Mm -hmm. But we're not focusing that half like like we're not even focusing one tenth of the energy that we focus on like people coming in from outside the country on these homegrown people who do these things. The thing is, it just seems it seems so easy for them to do this. And in reality, like this is Canada. Where are you getting guns? How is it so easy? I have no idea, but there is like the black market in Canada too, right? It amazes me. Yeah, but people there get is away we, with this. They're allowed to get away with it. They they fly under. So people like me and you, we're 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 on the radar. But then people like like Alex Manassian and like the 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 school shooter, they fly under the radar. Because the, the government is so focused on what we're doing that all these people just fly underneath. Let us not talk about these type of things. Next thing you know, people find us. <laughs> and they're like, they're talking conspiracies. And we're not talking conspiracies. Or they're, they're, they're saying too much truth and they shut us down. <laughs> these random two girls on YouTube and then our, our three followers. <laughs> Listen. The people might not be watching live. They'll just find it later. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, do you have any um, closing closing thoughts? Closing opinion? Much better than Anil's ghost. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to say that's 100% 100, 100 better than Anil's ghost. Divi, Divi, if you're still on here, make sure you read this because this will wash the ta the bad taste of Anil's ghost out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Anil's um, uh, Anika, what's our next book? Our next book is the graphic novel of The Parable of the Sower. By Octavia E. Butler. It's the graphic novel version. Yes, Divi. Exactly. Vic. Yes. Yes, Vic. That's a that's an ally right, right there. Round of applause. <laughs> I also I also wanted to get Vic on on one of these for like a true crime. True crime novel. <laughs> true crime. But um, yeah, we're going to be reading Parable of the Sour by one of the most famous uh, sci-fi writers sci ever, one of the best, Octavia E. Butler. So I hope you guys come in and tune for that, tune in for that. And when is that going to be? In two weeks. In two weeks. <laughs> May something. So... Let me pull up my calendar. So not May the nine. second, but the ninth, yeah. Shanj and I also have to create up, create our next roster. So keep an eye out for that on my Instagram. And I'd also love to do a little, um, a, like a, a session with uh, Shalina too, if she be, if she's down for like a '90s throwback. Yeah, she. Yeah, I told you she reached out to say she wanted to do something. Yeah, like a Nancy Drew and Boys session. Oh my god. Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys. Hardy Boys. That sounds about white. Pretty much, but that's what we were reading about then. <laughs> All right. Bro, you want to sign off? 
Okay, everybody. Thank you for joining us for whatever number this was of Brown Girls in the Ring Book Club. Don't keep counting anymore. Don't keep counting. <laughs> Listen, I gotta keep counting. Sean counts his, and he's at big numbers. <laughs> big numbers. Big numbers. <laughs> um, so yes, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you guys soon for previous, not previous, for future episodes. And give this book a read if you want. Nice read. It's also an audible. That's how I was able to finish it today. I did an immersive read where I was listening to it. And then when I got a chance to sit down, I'd read along with it. Oh, look, Sean knows it's Sean. number 17. <laughs> real one, real one. VIP. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyways, people, much love. Catch y'all on love. the flip side. We out.